Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hello, friends. Do you know what would be one of the best things that could happen in the entire world? That would be if you would follow me on Instagram or Facebook. That would make angels sing, lonely kittens find a new home and dinosaurs to come back. So please follow me on health, psychology and human nature on Instagram or Facebook. Welcome to Health, Psychology and Human Nature with André Stureson, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. Friends, today we have a very interesting episode with Professor Vittorio Galese. He explains why we like to go to the movies, what happens with us when we look at the movie, what the difference is between the absorption of a movie and the experience of the real world and a lot more. Check out Vittorio's book, The Empathic Screen, to learn more. Vittorio Galese, he's an MD and a trained neurologist and a professor of psychobiology and cognitive neuroscience at the Department of Medicine and Surgery of the University of Parma, Italy. His research focuses on the relation between the sensory motor system and cognition by investigating the neurobiological and bodily grounding of intersubjectivity, empathy, language and aesthetics. He's the author of more than 200 scientific publications and three books. Friends, please enjoy. Vittorio, buongiorno. Hi, good afternoon to you and to everyone who's listening to us. Maybe, maybe I should have said, uh, come stai? Is that, is that correct? Come stai? Yes, yes, correct. I'm, I, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Sto bene, grazie. <laughs> va bene, va bene. Um, all right, thank you for coming on. It's, um, it's a pleasure to have you. It's, and it's a, it's a very interesting topic that we're going to talk about here today. Hopefully so. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. But I've seen that you have been traveling around quite a bit. You've been in Switzerland and Japan and the US and Berlin. Yes, yes. Uh, I've been working uh, here and there. I'm, I'm pretty old. I'm 60. So it's um, more than 30 years that I am uh, doing this, uh, this work. I'm being involved in uh, uh, research in cognitive neuroscience. And I, I worked in several places, although I always uh, wanted to come back uh, to Italy. So um, I never wanted to to leave the, the country for good. Yeah. What, 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 what was it that you missed the most about Italy? Well, many things. Uh, many things you don't really appreciate while you're here, but uh, that become more evident uh, when they are missing. I'm talking about the light, the sunlight, the weather, uh, the lifestyle, living in a small town, a bicycle town where everything can be negotiated either on foot or by bike. It, it's um, much less of a hassle living in a 200,000 people city like Parma is. Yeah. And uh, of course, the food adds to the picture. Although I'm not, uh, I'm not too crazy about food. I mean, I, I'm... I, I normally enjoy the local food. I, I'm never going for Italian food when I'm abroad. But but when you're home, you're going you're going for the Italian. Yeah, food. of course. When I'm at home, <laughs> well, you know, in Italy, it's it's a bit difficult to have uh, uh, non-European good food. Uh, uh, it's uh, more difficult than any other northern European country because Italians are too conservative when it comes to food. So. People tend to believe the Italian food is the best in the world. Mm. And so you are having a hard time to get good uh, Viet food, Thai food, Indian food, ah. a lot of Asian food. Ah. So I'm usually happier in that respect when I'm abroad with respect than well, when I'm in Italy. <laughs> True. 
And you, you have been studying, as you said, cognitive neuroscience and um, a lot of interesting things. And we're going to talk about your book, The Empathic Screen. But, but before we get into that, as you've been researching this quite a lot, I would just like to ask you, like, what is it that you find uh, the most interesting about the brain? Well, I think the brain uh, in itself is a very interesting and challenging object of investigation because, uh, uh, let me be rather crude, it's uh, the necessary, although not sufficient, condition for being who we are. I mean, without brain, there's no consciousness, there's no uh, mental activity, there are no thoughts, no dreams, uh, nothing. So it's, um, it's a basic ingredient uh, uh, that has to be investigated if we want to shed more light on who we are and uh, where do we come from and possibly also where are we heading to. But as I said, it's uh, necessary but not sufficient. So I, I, I don't uh, believe that uh, uh, we can just say I am my brain. I am my brain and many other things. And these other things, of course, to me, uh, include the body and the brain body of others uh, and the physical world where we all live. Uh, all these elements are uh, necessary uh, to better understand who we are. Right. So we have to understand ourselves. Or, and and you, you think that it's, so it's about the brain, it's about the body, it's about the external world and, and others as well. Exactly, is what people now tend to designate with the four E, uh, talking about the mind, uh, embodied, embedded, enacted, and um, extended. And all of these four catchwords capture uh, some essential aspect uh, of the relationship between uh, uh, the brain and who we are. So I think it's necessary to study the brain to understand who we are, but not sufficient. And that's why since many years I actively search for uh, not only a dialogue, more than a dialogue, I would rather say a scientific collaboration from scholars from other disciplines, uh, uh, from the humanities, for example, philosophers, uh, anthropologists, uh, cognitive linguists, uh, film theorists, like in the case of the book, uh, um, literature scholars. I think that um, the questions we are asking are basically uh, all the same. What, what changes is the specific level of description that we yeah. employ. Neuroscience uh, is a very broad field. It goes all the way from molecules, receptors, neurotransmitters, up to a more integrated picture which deals with single neurons, groups of neurons, brain networks, cerebral areas, and the like. I started doing single neuron recordings in the animal model in, in the last 10, 15 years. I've been almost exclusively focusing with, uh, with the human brain. So the brain can be studied asking many questions uh, uh, to get many different answers. So the, the approach in itself doesn't necessarily tell you what you're up to. Much depends on uh, what are the, the questions that uh, you're willing to ask. And the questions, in turn, are very strongly determined, if not conditioned, by your own uh, uh, theoretical background. So according to the theoretical background uh, you start from, uh, you may be able to ask very different questions, and consequently, getting very different answers right what is the what is the most important thing that you've learned from all your research that we actually can like that we that we can apply in in our lives yeah well if i had to condense uh, um, almost 40 years of uh, <laughs> daily uh, relationship yeah yeah with the brain i i would squeeze it into three uh, catchwords Body, relation, experience. I think you need at least all these three catchwords uh, to put yourself in the best possible condition uh, to have um, an interesting uh, uh, research agenda. 
body, as I said, because uh, I don't think the brain uh, is a is a computer or a mere uh, algorithmic machine. Uh, the brain is part of the body. In that respect, my being an MD and a trained neurologist probably put me in a in, in a different position with respect to someone who investigates the brain coming from a different background like bioengineering or computer science. So going back to the brain, the brain is an organ, is part of the body. The body is the only interface between the brain and the world. So without the body, the the, the brain, so to speak, is deaf and blind and um, uh, still paralyzed. Uh, it couldn't do anything without the body. Mm -hmm. So I never subscribed uh, to the to the vision of a brain in a vat. So supposedly in the future there are people dreaming of uh, transplanting their old brain into a new body. Uh, there has been also some interesting science fiction uh, uh, movies uh, that um, ridicule uh, this uh, this idea. I don't know if you ever saw the movie. Uh, get Out, uh, which it's a dark comedy on this uh, delusion of humans that uh, what is in your brain can be downloaded uh, to some other medium or that can be literally transplanted or on a different body. And with the new body, you will keep, be, uh, keep being uh, yourself. I think that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> really? So, and the third very <laughs> crucial notion uh, that shouldn't be left out from the lab is experience. Everything we know about ourselves and about the world we, we, we live in is the experience we are making of those objects. So experience is a crucial element that makes us uh, who we are, and, and therefore we should start our investigation uh, exactly from the experiential domain uh, or at the very least this is something I try to uh, do uh, with with my empirical uh, research activity in the last 10 15 years or something right when you say that we should start in the experiencing domain what do you mean about that well I mean that uh, we we are not just symbol manipulators uh, we are not uh, a uh, creature that house uh, uh, algorithmic wonders. We feel something whenever we relate uh, to the world. So every uh, experience is the outcome of a particular relation. So we should study the experiences that we derive from our relations with the world, with the physical world, and even more importantly, with the world populated by other selves like us. Right. I think we, should, we could get into, uh, get into the book. Um, and I, I thought that if we could start from like a helicopter perspective. So, mm -hmm. so just your book, The Empathic Screen, what would you say, like in a ped pedagogical nutshell, what, what is it about? Yeah, okay. The Empathic Screen, Cinema and Neuroscience uh, brings together um, two kind of expertise. The expertise of a film theorist, Michele Guerra, who is professor of uh, film uh, at my university here in Parma, and the experience of, uh, of a neuroscientist like me. And um, we decided to write this book together to explain... Uh, how comes that we like going to the movies? How comes that movies uh, exert such a powerful impact uh, on spectators? How comes they are so powerful in engaging our attention, in making us uh, uh, empathize uh, with the characters uh, on screen, feeling anger, sorrow, fear uh, for the plot developing on the screen in spite of the patently falsehood uh, of what's going on. Nobody uh, would leave the movie theater uh, screaming because uh, a house is on fire on the screen. We know it to be fake. Nevertheless, we can't but weep, uh, participate, feel uh, for the characters in a way be being fully engaged. Uh, and we are uh, more engaged when the movie maker, the director, uh, is uh, 
best in uh, using a series of uh, technical tricks uh, that help us being engaged uh, with what's going on on the screen. And the book is uh, 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 dealing with these tricks. Uh, we we try to analyze film style, camera movements, uh, editing, close-ups, and, and try to explain how this trick work uh, using uh, our expertise in, in, in how the brain body works. I think it's fascinating because it's almost like it's another universe. I mean, if, when you're going to the cinema and you're watching a movie that really absorbs you, it is as if everything else just disappears. And it's almost, in a way, like yourself almost disappears, in a way. Not exactly. really, but, but it's like you really get absorbed. It's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, some kind of link almost to, to some other world almost. Yes, and uh, this uh, appears to be um, a, a feature uh, uh, really a, um, a trademark of our species. And indeed, not coincidentally, we decided to start the book in a Paleolithic cave, the very same cave of Chauvet where the German director Werner Herzog uh, uh, shot a beautiful documentary, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. According to the archaeologists, many of the Paleolithic uh, beautiful paintings portraying animals like bisons, uh, buffaloes, uh, uh, lions uh, and the like were painted specifically with the purpose of giving the impression of movement, mm. particularly so if one considers that uh, there were no neon light or LED lighting back then, all these uh, paintings could be barely seen by illuminating them uh, with the trembling light of torches. So the combination of the way they were painting, uh, painted and the source of illumination, according to the archaeologists, probably was fully exploited to give uh, the impression of movement. So we appear to be obsessed by setting images into motion. And more generally, we appear to be uh, obsessed by our total unsatisfaction with the present world, the world uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. We, we feel compelled to create parallel worlds, uh, the worlds of fiction, of imagination, that we are able to paint or uh, to narrate uh, through words. We are the only species, as far as we can understand, that is so obsessed by the possibility to create an alternative, uh, uh, a fantastic world, that uh, we are the only species creating uh, pictures, we are the only species uh, narrating stories and being obsessed by watching pictures, man-made pictures, and listening to uh, man-made uh, stories. This is uh, really something unique uh, that makes us different from all other living animals. It doesn't necessarily mean superior or inferior, but definitely different. So if cognitive neuroscience want to address the specificity of what does it mean to be human, it cannot neglect aesthetics. It should address aesthetics. And like we did in this particular case, films, cinema is a big part of aesthetics uh, since the end of the 19th century. For sure. I, I mean, and it's, it's, it's so fascinating that, that already for, I don't know, like 30, 35,000 years ago when these paintings are made, that already at this stage that we are, have already started to create moving pictures. That's just, exactly. it's just fascinating. Exactly. But why do you think that is, that we're so compelled about this? Well, you are bringing me on a territory which is not uh, specifically mine. I mean, yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a mechanic of the machine. I, I study how the, the brain body works. Uh, um, so this is a much bigger picture uh, um, and a much uh, deeper uh, question. Well, some people would say it has to do probably with the acquisition of language and through language, the acquisition of our sense of finitude. So uh, you could see it uh, as a kind of uh, way of defying uh, finitude and death by the possibility of uh, externalizing your thought and fantasies into something on a material substrate that will survive uh, uh, and uh, uh, go beyond uh, your limited time spent 
on the planet that will be there once you're uh, long gone. And uh, in order to make this parallel uh, uh, world uh, more appealing, uh, uh, movement probably has been uh, viewed, uh, considered from from the very beginning as a uh, unavoidable and a basic ingredient, and I would definitely agree with that. Okay, so, so uh, I don't, I, did, I didn't I didn't fully understand what what you said there in in the end. Could you explain that for me? As I said, so why we are obsessed by making images, or why are we obsessed uh, by making moving images or images that? Uh, look like moving. I think the two questions are related. Yeah. We are obsessed by the uh, opportunity to create a, a fantastic imaginary world because we are conscious that our world will end with us. Our mm. uh, life will come to an end. And so in an attempt to defy this feeling of finitude uh, uh, through the externalization of our imagination, uh. of our thought, into some uh, external medium, that external medium most likely will survive us, will be there uh, uh, also after we are long gone. And to make this uh, uh, parallel imaginary world uh, uh, more appealing, the uh, uh, inclusion of movement or, or of the illusion of movement in that parallel world uh, is probably uh, necessary to make it appealing, to make it to make it compelling, because movement is so important to us. Okay, so, so it could be that that we need to believe that there's something else after we're dead, or something else when we're gone, and and vid like and moving pictures, videos, and also still pictures could be a way for us to convince ourselves of that there's something else. Or yeah, I mean, and uh, I mean, it, it also gives you part of the uh, God power uh, to give birth uh, to creatures yeah. that depend for their existence uh, uh, exclusively on you. You are the one who make those bison and chasing lion visible because it's you who painted them on, on, the, on the wall of the cave. So you gave birth to something that wasn't ah, there before okay. and will be there once you are gone. So uh, that's the why I brought up the notion of cosmogonic uh, attitude. Uh, by that I mean the attitude to give birth to a, a, a different world of which in a way you are the God because you are the one creating that fantastic world okay. that didn't exist because your fantasy could find a, an externalized way into a painting, into a carving, uh, uh, into a song, into a ritual, into a dance, into whatever you may uh, designate as a, a cultural artifact. Right. Yeah. So it's so it's something that will still be there when you are gone. Kind of like I've heard something about Steve Jobs saying something about like that he wanted to put a dent in the universe, that that he had this purpose of ha having something. Yeah. I mean. Uh, this is the paradox of being human. I mean, we are uh, finite creatures. We, we know we have an expiry date. We don't know the date, but we know for sure we will expire. And we are damn pissed off with that. We don't like that at all. And so you m might be willing, as many did in the past, to see art, uh, the creation of cultural artifacts. I call it externalization because it's much more neutral. It means to pour out what inside your mind and turn it into an object that can be there also when you are not present anymore. I think this might be at least partly due uh, to the fact that we, are, we aren't happy at all with the consciousness of that expiry date. Hmm. That's, it's so fascinating that, that, and it also makes me think like, why, why, why do we need something that, that extends ourselves? It's just, uh, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, we are constitutively missing something. We are constantly projected towards something that isn't there. Uh, we, um, we push this to the limit. I think it's present also in, in other animals. Uh, it's, um, 
uh, it's the necessity to anticipate what isn't there. If you are a predator and you are waiting for your prey to show up, uh, for example, you must be able to represent uh, the prey who isn't there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be waiting for someone who hasn't showed up yet. True. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, so it's part that we share uh, clearly with other animals for a variety of reasons, and uh, among which I would definitely put the invention of language. Uh, this constitutive uh, uh, search for something which isn't here, but could be here uh, in the future, uh, bring us to uh, the creation, as we said before, of uh, imaginary world, uh, the, the imaginary world of fiction. But it, it is made possible by um, an ability that uh, we partly share with animals that uh, uh, did not produce paintings or didn't make movies or wrote novels. But we come from there, so there is a continuity in nature that can be spotted. Right. So, so, so they have something similar, like a, a more... Uh, I'm not sure if I can use the word rudimentary, but <laughs> maybe yeah, they, like they a more are basic way, version. A rudimentary, uh, able to represent something which isn't there. Right. Uh, they, they must have some form of fantasy that enables them to wait for someone who didn't show up yet, the prey. Right. So the prey has to be represented in its absence for you to uh, waiting for it and uh, be ready uh, to attack. Um, so is this linked to why we are like why we're interested in movies? Yeah, movies. Uh, it's um, uh, it's it's in total continuity, for example, with theater. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it it uh, it brings theater to uh, a different territory because of the uh, uh, technological progress. But if you think about it, also with theater, we participate in the most of the time tragic stories of, yeah. of characters, but we do it from. Uh, uh, so to speak, a safety distance. So the same distance that uh, was put between the screen and the seat you're sitting in when you watch a movie in a movie theater, a similar distance uh, um, keep you safe uh, with respect to the action on stage of a Greek tragedy like uh, Antigone's or Sophocles or whatever. You participate to the uh, tragic fate of those characters, but they are far away. Uh, you won't be touched. You will participate in those events, uh, and uh, in a way, you can uh, you can try. How does it feel uh, uh, to be killed? How does it feel to kill someone? How does it feel to be betrayed? How does it feel to betray someone? Uh, but again, from a safety distance. When the show is over, you go home. You feel better. It didn't happen to you, but you learn uh, something more about others and about yourself. And and the movies uh, uh, keep keep going on the same track, adding technology and making uh, things possible that clearly were beyond reach for Euripides, Aeschylus, or or Sophocles. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a it's such a such a fascinating thing to be able. I mean, I, I myself. There are, I mean, when, when it's a really good movie, if you're in a theater or if you're at home, um, I mean, the, the emotions that you can experience by watching a movie, it's quite, it's quite astonishing that you can, I mean, yeah. that you can, that you can feel so much that you begin, begin to cry or that you yell in your indeed, sofa. Indeed. Or, I mean, there are I mean, movies where I, I systematically weep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, some big scene I, I can predict, I will, uh, I will weep. Yeah. In spite of the fact that I, I saw the same movie maybe uh, a dozen times or more. Exactly. But exactly. nevertheless, it's so powerful that when the story, uh, uh, after many turns, reached that particular moment, uh, uh, that moment will trigger strong emotions, uh, uh, bringing me to tears. And that's also uh, why we like it so much. Because we can entertain uh, strong emotions from a, a distance, uh, 
um, being safe, feeling safe. Exactly. And I mean, as you alluded to earlier, I mean, looking at movies, good ones, really makes us feel it's it's it really creates something in us i mean it's i think it's it's uh, quite logical that or not logical but it's it's something that we really as human beings enjoy to get like a uh, a pause from our own reality to to enter something else where we i mean where we feel a lot and where we get stimulated a lot indeed indeed and, and you also talked about it being safe so it, it, do, you, do you think believe that also is an important aspect when looking at the movie to be able to enjoy it yes exactly i mean you know uh um uh, beside the 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 cognitive operation of uh, um uh, doing a, a sort of suspension of disbelief uh this suspension of disbelief uh, make you being totally aware that um uh, what is going to be presented on the screen will not affect you directly. There will be no uh, gunshot that will uh, uh, bless you or that will uh, injure you, that may turn out to kill you or whatever. You will participate uh, to the events that are being narrated, uh, but uh, you won't be affected directly. Uh, You will uh, experience uh, eventually strong emotions but that's why one of the main reasons why you're paying your ticket. You want to uh, experience strong emotions with simultaneously uh, being pretty sure that you, you're going to be safe. It's like uh, being on a roller coaster in a sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Although the roller coaster sometimes can be, can be tricky, can be dangerous, uh, while this is never going to happen watching a movie. I, I mean, unless your TV set uh, will uh, uh, suffer a short secret (laughs) and your home will be on fire. But that's a very unlikely event. Exactly. That definitely you're not predicting when you're turning on uh, the TV screen or when you enter a movie theater. Exactly. Uh, And and, I mean, the fascinating thing here also, you who know, I mean, a lot about the brain and the mechanics of the brain, like when, when we are deeply absorbed by a movie, when we're in in the cinema looking... I mean, what what would you say that the difference is being absorbed by a, a movie in a, a cinema or just being out in our own reality? Right. Of course, there's a huge difference uh, watching something real happening in front of you while you're sitting on a train on the subway or walking down the street and seeing something very similar on the bidimensional screen in a movie theater. I mean, on the one hand, this is uh, one of the many paradoxes that uh, you reveal as soon as you decide to uh, go a little deeper and investigate what's behind your experience uh, of the world uh, as such. By the world, I imply everything, reality and the world of fiction, of imagination. The first paradox is that as far as we understand the, the brain mechanism that kick in when you're watching a movie are almost the same as those that are relevant uh, uh, to make you perceive the real world once you get out of the movie theater. So they are basically the same mechanisms. Uh, so uh, there were uh, some scholars who uh, maintained that uh, the emotions being uh, driven by watching a movie or reading a novel are not true emotions just because they are not triggered by the real world, by, by a fictional world, an imaginary world. So some scholar proposed to designate the emotions we get from fiction as quasi-emotion. I think it's fake, it's false, it's totally wrong. I mean, there's plenty of evidence, not just uh, subjective, uh, phenomenal evidence. Uh, you're weeping, you're laughing. Uh, does it feel uh, a fake emotion when you're weeping watching a movie? I don't think so. But even going beyond uh, this uh, introspective truth, if you allow me the term, when we go to investigate the nuts and bolts of those experiences by investigating how the brain works, uh, we discover that, uh, for example, mirror neurons the neurons that uh, we discovered in the 90s 
that somehow link an agent to the observer. So to the, to the extent that this neuron uh, are activated when we perform a given action, but also when we watch someone else uh, performing the same actions, they have been tested uh, uh, um, by uh, looking at uh, what happens uh, when the, uh, the action is uh, uh, seen while performed by a real agent uh, present uh, uh, with his body in front of you and comparing that uh, with what happens when you watch the same action presented on a bidimensional computer screen. And most of the neuro would respond to both. Although some will prefer the real thing uh, uh, with respect to the uh, bidimensional version, film version of the action, uh, in the sense that it will respond more strongly to the real action than to the film one, the vast majority of the neurons uh, will respond to both. And I'm talking about neurons recorded in macaques. So in a species that hasn't yet invented the uh, language, so to speak. So it is not surprising at all that in the human brain, uh, the brain mechanism mediating um, uh, between you and the images on the screen are basically the same as those uh, mediating our meeting with reality. But definitely there are differences. For example, as I said, when uh, you are about to watch a movie, you know it is um, a movie. So there is a sort of cognitive uh, modulatory effect uh, uh, on those uh, perceptual mechanisms, telling you, pretend it to be true, nevertheless, it's fake. So that our bodily reaction are not the reaction you would, uh, uh, we would uh, execute instantiate if we were in the real life. Then there is another condition which is particular that in the book we describe as liberated embodied simulation. If you think about it, when we enjoy fiction, be it uh, reading a book, watching uh, a painting uh, uh, um, in a museum, uh, enjoying a movie in a movie theater, watching a video installation, whatever, we are still. We are still, and most of the time, we are in a safe place. Yeah. Both mm -hmm. conditions, uh, in a way, being in a safe place, you are at home, you are in a theater, you are in a museum, broadly speaking, shut the world out. Exactly. So you don't need to bother uh, with the intrusiveness of the world because you are in a secluded and protected space, be it, as I said, your home or, or a designated cultural space a place where people go to have this kind of experiences, a movie theater or a museum. Second, you are still. And by being still, uh, we hypothesize that most of your uh, simulative brain resources can be entirely or uh, predominantly put uh, into the service of uh, your fiction experience, making it more vivid, more engaging, uh, more emotional, uh, so in a way, uh, boosting the experience you get, sometimes making it stronger than the experience that you would make uh, of a similar event in, in your real life. Okay, so, so you mean that, that because, because we know that we are in a safe place or in a safe space, we, like, it's like our brain allows us to feel yeah. more? Kind of. We can let it go more than we are normally uh, allowing ourselves to do uh, when we are confronting uh, uh, the potential intrusiveness of, uh, in real life. Uh, we are always, so to speak, en garde. Exactly. Uh, so we, uh, we are always expecting that something unexpected might happen, much less so when we immerse ourselves uh, into the aesthetic contemplation of a, of a work of fiction. Yeah. And this is probably also why it's so entertaining, because for a couple of hours we, we let everything else go and we live exclusively uh, this uh, um, imaginary narrative that can absorb all of our 
cognitive and bodily resources. Exactly, it takes up everything. But couldn't it also be that filmmakers have, I mean, have learned how to put us, I mean, how to to get us to feel and to, and that so it's it's kind of. So it's kind of that they're using everything they have. So, and that is also a way of explaining why, I mean, yeah, why you yeah, feel so much. You're definitely right. For example, a colleague of mine, a famous colleague of mine, Antonio Damasio, the author of Descartes, Error, and many other very successful books on cognitive neuroscience, uh, um, once said that uh, um, from the very beginning of the history of filmmaking, uh, filmmakers... Uh, must have been some uh, a kind of uh, uh, unconscious uh, 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 scientist of the brain because <laughs> yeah, they were able to exploit so well uh, how the brain works to make uh, uh, their movies uh, as engaging as possible. If you think about it, um, in the book we, 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 we speak, we wrote extensively about camera movements and editing, but if you think about it, uh, your uh, experience of the real world is the outcome of the editing being done by by your by your brain. Uh, if you take uh, your mobile phone and you shoot the scene uh, of the room where you're sitting now as we speak, and systematically you place your hand uh, in front of the uh, lens of your mobile phone uh, for two seconds every 20 seconds, when you rewind and watch what you shot, you will see all those blanks uh, corresponding to the time when you occluded the lens uh, with the palm of your hand. If you think about it, this happens all the time when we watch the world. We keep on blinking, closing our eyes yeah. uh, for a number of times, every second and uh, every minute. And we also, you have to add that we move our eyes constantly. So if you combine the moment where we are, so to speak, uh, vision blind because of the saccadic movements and the moments where we are blind because of uh, uh, the blinking, uh, which is like uh, covering uh, uh, the length of your eye, uh, uh, about a third of what we normally feel we see it's actually totally built by our brain it's missing it's totally missing so editing exploits something our brain is perfectly capable to do well before cinema was invented exactly so it's just just so, because that i find that fascinating so 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 that our brain is taking in all this information and then yeah. the, the information I mean, people don't think about it. No, no, exactly, no, exactly, exactly. This is exactly what happens. Exactly that we that we the, the brain edits all the information, and then we it, it's like we get what what we experience is actually like a movie in a way. Exactly. I mean, it's edited. It's not the raw, <laughs> raw light waves that we get. It's exactly. It's it's exactly. the, and it's also it's also the it's also for a purpose, right? Well, yes, in, in principle, it is the way it is because uh, it is the best possible adaptive way uh, we can exploit to survive on this planet. So our senses evolved in such a way to enable uh, the possibility to have a, a perceptual record of the world which maximizes our fitness in that world. It, it's a long uh, it's a long journey that brought us, for example, at a certain point to, to enjoy color vision. Some people claim that we developed color vision as soon as uh, we weren't able to autonomously and endogenously produce vitamin C. All of a sudden, we had to look for vitamin C in the external world. And what best uh, uh, help to spot uh, uh, a ripe fruit uh, a color vision that enables you to spot the ripe one from the not ripe uh, one. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the way we are uh, and the way, because the way we are, the way we uh, build uh, the representation of the world is the outcome of a long adaptive journey. Yeah. And, and that is also probably why, I mean, that is also probably why we like movies also 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the main the main reason uh, we we covered that already because it enabled us something that could be really dangerous in real life, uh, but uh, just because it's fictional, we can endure uh, having those experiences and those experiences in a way enrich the baggage of. Uh, knowledge we we have about the world and about ourselves so in, in in a way make us better equipped to cope with the challenges of the world particularly the, the challenges posed by our social interactions in the world and also i mean another very fascinating thing i think is that i mean i will never i can never enter the world of vittorio <laughs> i mean i can, I can I, if we met we, I mean, I, I can see you physically, I can hear your voice, but I can never experience your feelings or your thoughts from a first person perspective. Well, I mean, uh, this is just partly true. I don't share, I don't share the radical uh, skepticism of classic cognitivism, according to which the other uh, for the self is a problem. So the problem of others uh, can be solved according to this cognitive uh, recipe only by creating theories about the other. The other is totally uh, opaque to me unless I can uh, build a theory of the mind of the other. Yeah. Uh, I definitely share with you the uh, idea that uh, the other is never totally transparent to me, but I mean, I can greatly reduce that gap by simulating what you feel. If you hammer your thumb and you say, I, uh, I don't need to build a theory of your mind in order to understand that you are in pain. Uh, because when that happens, part of the brain machinery in my brain that normally kicks in when I feel pain will simulate your pain. So I will never be able to understand how does it feel to be in that particular kind of pain for you, that will be uniquely yours. Yes. And there's no way to break through and, uh, and uh, feel the pain that you feel, but I can feel that you are somehow feeling pain yes. without necessarily building a, a, a meta-representational theory of your mind. So I think the, the cognitivist went too far in uh, um, saying that uh, uh, we are uh, totally um, separated uh, by others, and the only way to breach this wall is to build a theory. I think behavior is uh, enormously rich in information, and many of this information are, are readily at hand uh, by means of mirroring mechanisms, simulation mechanisms. Right. This is not the whole story, of course, and sometimes things don't add up. Sometimes you say no, I think you mean yes or the other way around, so I need to sit and think on it. But in many situations of daily life, we just simulate what we see, and that's enough yes. to understand what's going on. And, and I mean, that is what is very, very interesting also, if we go back to the movies again, that this is something that, I mean, it, it brings us closer to how it is to be someone else. If you look at the, somebody who's living a, ter a terrible life, or if you're looking at somebody who's rescuing somebody from... A burning house, for example. Yeah, I mean, indeed. It, it's something that it 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 shifts our perspectives in a way, also in ways and that this uh, this in a way I think is telling us something very important from a political and ethical point of view. If you want to inform people political decisions on any topic, on any issue, just because we are not those pure, rational animals, as we have been told for ages, but we rely so much on imagination, on narratives, uh, on stories. Uh, uh, in order to have an impact on people's decision, to inform their decisions, I think numbers, figures, diagrams, uh, um, are very poorly equipped to do this. Mm. Uh, uh, in order to have um, uh, a full-fledged information about something going on in the world, you need to provide images with the correct narrative. Only when we have images and a story, we empathize, we realize what's going on, uh, uh, processes of identification 
uh, start to emerge. So I think it's not uh, sufficient uh, to show numbers and, and statistics. Uh, these have a very limited impact uh, on people's political choices, and we see it every day uh, by, by seeing what's going on in the world as we speak. Right, so, so, so being able to f experience something, exp like in somehow experience what it's like to be poor or what it's like to, be, have, to have a disease or whatever, is much, yeah. more, is, mu is much more convincing than seeing statistics about this. Exactly, habits. exactly. Because uh, our brain bodies uh, were shaped, uh, modeled and tuned uh, to, to interact uh, physically. Uh, with other people, and this means to look at people in their faces, show what they say, what kind of expression their body acquires, their facial expression is uh, um, when, when they utter specific words. I mean, this is what I mean by experience. A full-fledged experience cannot be built just on numbers or words. We need bodies, we need faces, we need voices. And this is something which uh, some people have learned pretty well, some other people uh, not yet, unfortunately. No. Uh, I'm talking about political communication. Uh, so so f from your work with, uh, from your research and writing this book and everything, what, what would you say like, is the, the main things that, that you have learned? Well, I've learned many things. Uh, I've learned that um, the body is a necessary ingredient for any attempt uh, to shed new light on the role of the brain in our mental life. You cannot divorce the brain from the body. Second, I've learned uh, the enormous role of uh, emotions, the role emotion play in, in our life and why we systematically look for emotions outside our daily chores in, in, uh, in our daily life through uh, the narrative of fiction, and in particular, if we stay with the book, uh, with the narrative provided uh, by films. Uh, I learned that movie makers uh, were incredibly talented from the very beginning, um, in the sense that they exploited the, the technology uh, available uh, to fool us in the best possible way, exploiting uh, unknowingly, most likely, the way our brain uh, enables us to entertain a, a, an experience of the world. So, for example, people at a certain point uh, uh, wanted to bring the, the spectators more into the scene, more into the action, and they invented the Steadicam. And by means of the Steadicam, they were no longer uh, uh, confined with the, with the sharp angles uh, uh, dictated by the railway of the Dolly track, as uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, said about The Shining, which is the, the epitome, uh, uh, the glorification, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm, of yeah. the Steadicam. And with our approach, we were able to show why the Steadicam is so engaging, because it literally brings you into the scene. We walk along with the eye of the camera. We walk along with the cameraman, and we see things through the eyes that movies uh, that moves in, in within the scene uh, with an incredible uh, 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 fluence, uh, uh, which is the same uh, that we derive from our experience as we move around uh, in the world. So basically, I learned how closely uh, fiction resembles reality and how the brain uh, uh, enables us to live uh, in both worlds uh, without confusing one with the other, if everything is wired properly, so to speak. Right, so it's so so filmmakers really, it's almost like uh, magicians have learned about yeah. how attention. So it's really about learning about how how we work as human beings, and then using that to make good movies that has great effects on us. Yeah, that, well, that one nice us. way to put it uh, would be that the book it tells you what this magic is all about. And it's, it's also interesting what you said about emotions that that you that you have you have learned even about the the role of emotions and how important they are as well. Yes, I think this is one of the uh, most important uh, finding of uh, cognitive neuroscience in the last 30 years. I mean, we left behind the idea that everything is purely rational, 
that our behavior is guided by uh, our own self-interest. Uh, it turns out that uh, we do things also when they do not totally fulfill our self-interest. We discover that we can be altruistic. Uh, uh, we discover that we can be sympathetic. And most of all, we discover that our choices, uh, our line of conduct uh, is by all means uh, correct and healthy only to the extent that it, it is supported uh, by, by uh, a properly wired uh, system enabling us to feel emotions. Without emotions, uh, we, are, we are not uh, in the best position to make choices. Actually, our, our choices are, are totally wrong, are not guided anymore uh, uh, properly, and we become social outcasts without emotions. That's what beautifully shows uh, Antonio Damasio with the case of Phineas Gage in his book, uh, uh, Descartes' Error, for example. When you suffer a brain lesion that prevents you to decide on the basis of your emotions, uh, your life is ruined. You do not become more rational. You become uh, more socially disabled, period. So emotions are crucial to understand who we are, more than rationality in itself, I would say. Right. So, so if you have lesions, if you have damage to your brain, that damage, so so you won't, so you don't, you don't understand or you don't feel emotions, then that is something that's very. Deep. Yeah, your decisions are not right or correct anymore. You take uh, a useless and almost risks. You behave improperly. In the end, uh, you become a social outcast because uh, people are not able to cope with your deranged behavior. Okay, Vittorio, I, I really, really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, for those who are more interested, they, they can check out your book, The Empathic Screen. And, and uh, I would just like to ask you just one, one last question with this a more of a more general kind. Right. So let's say that you were the leader of, uh, of a country, hypothetically speaking. Like, what would be one thing that, that you would, uh, would like to change? Well, as um, a comparative uh, exam of um, uh, contemporary counters show, uh, I would invest uh, a lot in uh, education and research. I mean, giving uh, to young people the opportunity to learn and to develop their skills, uh, I think is the best antidote uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, warfare, to uh, dictatorship, uh, uh, it fosters uh, uh, democracy, uh, a more equal society. So education uh, uh, and research would be my top priority. Right. Why, why do you think that, I mean, education will help us uh, with, uh, with, with situations with wars? And because the world is complicated and uh, because it is complicated, it requires a complicated solution. And the more you are educated, you're more, the more you are able to develop uh, a critical sense, the more you are uh, self-aware, uh, the more you are acquainted that, that uh, a slogan uh, will be useful to win a political campaign. But certainly with slogan, you don't solve problem. Actually, you risk to perpetrate the problems that uh, gender the fear uh, that make people voting for you. So with a better education, uh, with better opportunities, you reduce the gap between the richest and the poorest, and uh, you uh, uh, create uh, more self-aware citizens uh, that are able to base their decision on uh, an informed consent uh, mm. rather than being the easy prey uh, to slogan uh, uh, of ideology where everything is simple, everything is black and white. We are the good and all the other are the bad. We saw how it ends up with history. And in order to avoid that, I think the only solution is to um, um, uh, fund education. Right. Victoria, it's been a it's been a real bless talking to you. I would really, really like to thank you for for coming on and to sharing your knowledge with us. So a big, big thank you. Yeah, I thank you and uh, thank the listener for their patience in going through all of this. <laughs> uh -huh. Hope you enjoyed the episode, friends. I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there. 
So I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. (laughs) 